Welcome to today's webinar, Preparing for the Next Generation, How Maternal Information Passed to Progeny. I'm Yukiko Yamashira, a member at the Whitehead Institute, where my lab studies the mechanism of asymmetric stem cell division, as well as a function of junk DNA, and it's their implications in the cancer and other diseases. I'm excited to be your host and the moderator today. So today's webinar is part of a, the series of talks that we've organized uh, to share Whitehead Institute of Science and the research with the wider community. Uh, in a few moments, we'll hear from our presenter, Whitehead Institute Director, Luz Lima. Uh, so, but first, I'd like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded for future viewing. And also we'll be answering questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So you can, but you can submit the questions at any time using the Q&A box that you can see on your screen. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Luz Lima. So Luz received her PhD with a future Nobel laureate, Christine nusrein Borhard at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen. Uh, in Germany, and after postdoctoral training at the MRC in Cambridge, United Kingdom, she joined the Whitehead Institute uh, and MIT. Then she was recruited to NYU, returning uh, after 24 years, I do see, uh, to Whitehead Institute as a fifth uh, director, uh, where she is also a professor of MIT Department of Biology. So uh, the using Drosophila as a model system, Luz is the person who had established the mechanism how germ cells are formed, such that the life can continue from generation to generation. So germ cells are the very special cell type and the only cell type that can transmit the potential to build the entire whole organisms. Again, which also creates a germ cell again to go to the next whole, uh, you know, the organisms and so on. And uh, so, and that means without the germ cells, this unique characteristics, life simply does not go on. So because we have significant contribution to our understanding of germ cell biology, Luz has, been, has received numerous recognitions and reflecting the fact that this, these findings have been so fundamental to all areas of biology. Her recognition also spans all areas, um, just to pick a few, uh, receiving a concrete medal of the Society of Developmental Biology, Key Sporter Award from American Society for Cell Biology, then you know, Thomas Hannah Morgan Medal from Genetics Society of America, as well as most recently Gruber Prize in Genetics. So uh, the Luz is a member of the also American Academy of Arts and Science and the National Academy of Sciences, among many others. So I stop here uh, um, without listing all as accomplishment, uh, but just simply hand it to over Luz. So today she will share her findings uh, on how maternal information passes to the progeny through germ cells. Uh, Luz, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, Yukiko. Um, I'm so delighted to talk to you today. Um, let me share my screen. So I want to talk to you today about how we're preparing for the next generation. You just heard in the introduction how Yukiko is telling that we are interested in the germline. And so I want to talk today about how um, pretty much in every organism, multicellular organism, we prepare for the next generation. And let's get sort of start with the beginnings. And that is um, an egg and sperm. And can you see my pointer? Um, where the egg and sperm is um, uniting and is fer the fertilized egg cell starts to divide and uh, forms many different cells. And some of these cells then will again give rise to egg and sperm. And um, both the mother and the father contribute their um, nuclear genome to the next generation. And this is the cycle goes on and on. And so the germline is a really specific um, cell in the body because it's really not required for the organism itself. It is required for the perpetuation of the species. So let's look at this a little closer. And that is, I wanna point out the difference in size. 
um, when the egg meets the sperm. And that also tells me to tell you um, that the there is so much more that the egg provides than what the sperm provides. Both of them are providing DNA, but the egg provides also all the cytoplasm that is required um, to help actually the embryo to develop because initially the embryo is dividing rapidly. And so all the cytoplasmic components of the early developing embryo really come from the mother, come from that cytoplasm. So while the, um, whoops, while the mother um, and the father provide the DNA for the nucleus, um, there are cytoplasmic, all kinds of cytoplasmic aspects which are provided to the egg cell just from the mother, from the oocyte. And one of them, and this is my, the focus of the talk today that I will be talking about are mitochondria. What I want to also point out at this, this point is that um, it's quite curious that um, this, this kind of difference of contribution is also reflected in the diseases of reproduction. So with aging, um, male, um, so, so, so older fathers, um, their offspring um, often has new mutations um, which affect you know, cognitive ability of the progeny, um, but it is, um, it, is the, it is the mutations which occurred during the many divisions um, of the, uh, in, in, in the male gonad to produce sperm. On the other hand, the female, in the female, the oocytes are arrested. There isn't that much division. They're actually arrested for many, many years. And there, the disease of aging is cytoplasmic so that the chromosomes do not segregate properly because cytoplasmic components are not working properly to segregate the chromosomes properly at meiosis. So there's a very distinct um, consequences of this unequal um, contribution to the embryo. So um, let's look more closely at mitochondria. And um, so mitochondria have their own DNA um, they also, mitochondria have, um, have two membranes. They are um, uh, originally um, uh, uh, derived from protobacteria uh, many billion years ago. And um, within, the, um, within the inner membrane, which is, is forming these um, uh, intricate cristae um, in, this, uh, in this matrix, there is the mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondria have their own genome. And on these cristae, we have um, one of the many different machineries of the, um, that, that are contributed by the mitochondria, and that's the oxidative ph phosphorylation machinery. And um, this one uh, is, has components which are both produced by the nucleus, and so they have to be imported into the mitochondria, but also by the mitochondria themselves. And so in humans, um, there are about 16,000 uh, DNA base pairs of this mitochondrial DNA, which encode for 37 genes, 13 of these are protein coding, and they are distributed between those various complexes of the uh, oxidative phosphorylation machinery. On the other hand, there are about 1,500 protein coding genes in the nuclear, um, nuclearly encoded, um, and 77 of these proteins again contribute to this machinery. Um, there are other component, there are other um, aspects of mitochondria, like for example the TCA cycle, um, factors which are required for protein import, fatty acid, amino acid oxidation, apoptosis, um, biosynthesis of ketones, pyrimidines, heme, and urea. All of those are provided by these nuclear proteins. So it's a very small number of proteins which are exclusively synthesized by um, the ribosomes which are in, in the mitochondria and then inserted into this inner mitochondrial membrane. Why is it so important and so interesting that mitochondria have actually their own DNA? It actually allowed us to understand um, how the migration of humans occurred. 
And you probably have heard of mitochondrial Eve and mitochondrial Eve started, and this is a particular um, haplotype of mitochondria because mitochondria carry different mutations and with the variation of the mitochondrial DNA and by having it given on from generation to generation, always through the mother, the mitochondrial Eve could be located. And then the various migrations of humans could be followed by um, the pattern of these haplotypes and as they were changing through generations. And I'll talk more about what these, what it means these haplotypes mean. Um, but so this has been very helpful. You may also know mitochondrial uh, DNA has been used for, for many different aspects um, uh, of um, um, uh, also familiar um, uh, 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 connections. And so, um, the mitochondrial DNA, as I said, is, is relatively small compared to the nuclear DNA, and it has these protein coding genes. And when there are mutations in the protein coding genes, um, then um, this can lead to diseases. And there are a whole number of uh, diseases which are associated with mitochondrial uh, DNA mutations. Um, of the inherited mitochondrial disorders, about 15 to 20% are due to the maternally inherited mitochondrial DNA. The others are all due to mutations in the nuclear contributions uh, to the genome, uh, to, the, to the function of the mitochondria. And so um, because mitochondrial DNA can mutate and change, we can have mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. And so that can cause then my, uh, mitochondrial um, uh, uh, dysfunction of, uh, because there's uh, one of the important protein components of the mitochondria is mutated. And so um, what's interesting, and this is this will be the is sort of the focus has been the focus of our interest is um, how do the mitochondria contribute to the next generation? And if we think about this, so if we have a mother who has both um, wild type mitochondria DNA and mitochondrial DNA with mutations, when she produces progeny then this pro her progeny will of course have one chromosome set from the mother, one chromosome set exactly from the father, but the contribution of the mitochondrial DNA will be very different. So there can be low heteroplasmy when you know, just one type of mitochondria is transmitted, or there can be a high number or amount of heteroplasmy. And you can already imagine dependent on what the low part of heteroplasmy is, that low part could mean that the offspring has a lot of wild type copies of mitochondrial DNA, or it could mean that the offspring has a high concentration of mutant mitochondrial DNA leading to a, a disease. And this explains why um, mitochondrial DNA mutations um, in terms of penetrance of the disease are very heterogeneous because it really depends on the kind of inheritance, uh, the amount of inheritance of the defective mitochondrial DNA. And so um, if we look at, just compare mitochondria and, um, and a nuclear DNA, um, so we know, and we just discussed this, that um, you know, the, the father and the mother um, gives one copy of each chromosome. And so we have exactly an N of two in every cell, um, including the you know, early in the early embryo. Um, in contrast, in the egg, we have actually um, uh, four, up to, uh, to four times 10 to the five, uh, 400,000 copies per egg um, of mitochondrial DNA, which is here marked in, in red. Um, we also know that there is a heightened mutation rate in mitochondrial DNA. It's 10 times higher than the nuclear genome. And this has less to do with the fidelity of the replication enzymes, but more to do with the proofreading. And also mitochondrial DNA actually turns over. So during aging in non-germ cells, um, the mitochondria keep on turning over and then new mitochondrial DNA is replicated, giving a chance for mutations to occur. And each mitochondrial DNA molecule lives for about 
about uh, a, a, a week. Um, so there is even in a cell which doesn't divide, there is constant replication of the mitochondrial DNA and the potential for new mutations to occur. Finally, and this is a really important aspect of um, uh, uh, germline development when we look from the chromosomal um, nuclear standpoint, that is recombination. So each time a egg cell or a sperm cell is produced, um, the two ends that were inherited from the father and the mother have to be reduced to a one end so we can have actually one copy of each chromosome coming from the mother and one copy from each chromosome coming from the father this in the process of meiosis. And what happens during meiosis is that the DNA from of the father uh, 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 of the that the, that the DNA can recombine and make new associations. And these new associations can lead to this recombination process can lead to um, being able to make actually better copies and coping with mutations. That is not the case in, um, in, in largely in mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA molecules, these circular mitochondrial DNA molecules, they do not, or they have very highly reduced recombination. So if we put these two aspects together, if we say on the one hand, we have this heightened mutation rate, and on the other hand, we have no recombination possibilities to make actually better copies by recombination by getting actually rid of some of the uh, uh, deleterious mutations. Um, this has been referred uh, in, in, in the 30s uh, uh, by Muller um, as a, a, a ratchet model. And that means this ratchet continuously accumulating mutations would eventually lead to um, death because there would be more and more mutations. And if you can't do anything about it, uh, you would accumulate these mutations, but that's obviously not happening. And so there have to be mechanisms of how, um, um, uh, how uh, mitochondria actually deal with the mutation rate. And so there are two principal phenomena that I want to mention. And then um, in, the, in, in my talk, I want to really talk about some of the mechanisms of those um, uh, phenomena. So the first is referred to as a bottleneck. And so if we think of um, a, um, a, 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 a germ cell, maybe we think of an egg cell here, and the green molecules are um, mitochondrial DNA that is um, wild type, and the red ones are mutant, and we have here a heteroplasmic um, cell. If this cell um, goes through a bottleneck, which means it produces more cells which few, with, with just a selection of these mitochondrial DNA molecules, as for example happens when the egg cell starts to divide and germ cells are set aside out of the whole million, of the hundred thousands of, of uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA molecules. And so some of these cells now can capture more mutant and some will capture um, more wild type mitochondrial DNA. They grow up and we will get a very, uh, this heterogeneity um, in terms of heteroplasmy. So this is one effect. This effect is not, uh, it's sort of more random. It's like a lottery. Um, so you just throw out the balls and whatever you catch in a small vessel, or it's also, you could also call it drift like um, uh, Darwin's finches where the finches flew to an island and then they start the colony and that colony will be more similar to themselves. So this is this kind of bottleneck effect. Another is a more active process and that is the process of selection. So again, we start with a mixture of um, functioning and non-functional mitochondrial DNA molecules, but then there is an active process where somehow the mutant mitochondrial DNA molecules can be deleted. And so we end up um, after the selection process uh, with uh, uh, in enrichment of um, wild type mitochondrial DNA molecules. And so these two processes are really interesting processes and there's lots of evidence that something like this occurs. And so for example, one reason to, to, to sort of believe that selection has to occur are results um, in looking at actually the type of mutations which are passed on from one generation to the next generation by 
um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, mitochondrial DNA. So there are two kinds of mutations. There are mutations which are synonymous, and those are sort of um, mutations which really do not matter because they will lead to the same kind of amino acid being incorporated into the protein. And then there are mutations which are non-synonymous, which cause mutations because it would lead to um, either an amino acid change in the protein or even a stop codon in the protein. And so what has what had been observed in many different species, in mice and humans, that there is a much higher frequency of synonymous mutations being passed on through generations, they're non-synonymous, suggesting that there had to be a selection mechanism. But what the selection mechanism actually is and at what level and at what time it occurs was really not known. And so now I want to switch to um, telling you about our data. And so we use, um, uh, 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 we use Drosophila as our model system. And Drosophila have mitochondria and they have germ cells and the mother gives on the mitochondria to the progeny. Some of you may have wondered, so what happens to the father's mitochondria? So what happens in the, in the fly to the father's mitochondria? And this is work from Pat O'Farrell's lab where they showed that those mitochondria are actually degraded prior to um, the, uh, uh, in, at the late stages of sperm formation. And so then the sperm will not have any mitochondria. In other species, the paternal mitochondria actually get into the egg, but then they are degraded um, in the egg and during the, during the early um, development stages. So in Drosophila, the germ cells form at the posterior pole of the uh, freshly laid egg. And um, and that is also where I will be telling you about how do the mitochondria actually make it into the germ cells. And I will, and I will use this explanation as telling you something about the bottleneck effect. And then we will turn to the later stages of oogenesis, where actually the egg is made. And there I will show you um, data that suggest a selection mechanism that is occurring during that stage. So in the fly, there are um, two bottleneck effects and selection effects are present. And we have some idea of the mechanisms. And we think that um, the separation in different times, one occurring during embryogenesis and the other occurring at later stages to development could very well be also true for other um, species. So let's first look at the bottleneck effect. So what actually happens in the early embryo when these germ cells are forming at the posterior pole of the embryo, uh, mitochondria are specifically localized um, to, these, to the germ cells and so are taken up into the germ cells. And you can see this here, when you look, the here is actually, uh, the, the, the fly embryo is a little funny because it doesn't have cells early on. It actually, actually has just DNA, which is replicating. So the chromosome are, are replicating. And so here we have an island of nuclei. Um, but, at the, whoops, but at the posterior pole, you can see there are mitochondria are highly enriched. And that is the same region where the germ cells are forming. And so um, we um, uh, would call this a bottleneck effect because we are um, sequestering certain mitochondria, not every mitochondrium of the, of the egg is obviously going to go into the germ cells. And this is something which happens in every organism. So this lottery of the bottleneck is occurring in every organism, because as soon as you set aside one cell, you're only taking a, 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 a small dip of the entire pool of uh, mitochondria. And we identified um, a a protein uh, which is called long Oscar. And this protein is specifically required through the actin meshwork to um, capture the mitochondria at this region where the germ cells form. And so you can see um, when we don't have this protein present, then um, the uh, mitochondria are not enriched. And um, in we can we actually know that this enrichment is about 75 percent uh, uh, of the uh, 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 decreased when we when we don't have uh, this en enrichment, 
And so what does this mean sort of in terms of a bottleneck? Um, so we first, we know that this particular long form of OSCA captures the mitochondria. It does it actually independently of the other formation of the germ cells. It does so through um, the actin meshwork, which is sort of illustrated here. Um, and we know tropomyosin is an important component in capturing the mitochondria. And then what we think is what this larger pool of mitochondrial genomes does is may sort of increase the bottleneck. So, so actually more mitochondria end up in the germ cells than in other cells of the organism. And this may actually affect transgenerational con uh, 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 may, may have transgenerational effects because you could imagine now if you if you widen this bottleneck, um, you will have a larger selection of different mitochondrial genomes from which to select with more active mechanisms, which I will be talking about next. So is there mitochondrial selection? So the question is, we have here an oocyte developing in the female, and this oocyte has wild type and mutant DNA and uh, molecules, and will then somehow in the egg be a selection process so that more wild type DNA is passed on, mitochondrial DNA is passed on. I should also point something out that I um, forgot to tell you um, uh, before about the mitochondria. So um, the mitochondria is this organelle with the extra uh, with the with the two matrices, and multiple mitochondrial DNA molecules can be in one mitochondrium. So what could be? How could selection actually work? And so it could be on the um, organismal level, and we kind of alluded to this already. If there is a, if there is a um, uh, inheritance of too many mitochondrial uh, mutant mitochondrial uh, molecules in the egg, and now the egg is fertilized, the embryo, the progeny may actually fail to develop. So that would be on the level of the organism. We could also imagine that there could be um, selection at the, uh, at the level of the cell. So like when we were talking about the uh, effect of the bottleneck. So let's imagine when you form the germ cells and some germ cells have mostly wild type mitochondrial DNA, so they will do fine. But if they have mostly mutant DNA, then the, the cell may die. And finally, we can imagine this happening at the level of the organelle, where there's specific picking of, mito of, of those mitochondria and survival of those mitochondria um, that, are, um, that have mostly normal wild-type mitochondrial, functional mitochondrial DNA. And so we set out to say, let's study this. And the way we wanted to study this is we wanted to be able to actually see the mitochondrial DNA, because this is a big problem. I was telling you about polymorphism between mitochondrial DNA, where there are single mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, but how do we know then why the mitochondria have mutant DNA or wild type DNA? And so we wanted to move the analysis to that we can actually image the mitochondrial DNA. And so we used a trick for this, several tricks, and I will go through those tricks a little bit. So the first trick was to use actually mitochondria from a different species. And so these mitochondria um, here, they, um, they are from Yakuba, and this is a different Drosophila species. And we can actually take this cytoplasm at the posterior pole where the germ cells will form, and we can put that for transplant that from one species into another species. And so, um, whoops, what we did is we transplanted the, the mitochondria from Yakuba into. Um, melanogaster embryos, they then grew up and now they had two types of mitochondria. And there was another trick and that was that um, the melanogaster um, uh, mitochondrial DNA actually contained a mutation. This mutation was generated in the lab of Pat O'Farrell at UCSF. And it's a really neat mutation because it's a temperature sensitive mutation. So at the permissive temperature, the melanogaster flies are perfectly fine, but if the, the temperature is increased, then um, the organism cannot survive. 
Now, of course, with this, now they will have this helper um, mitochondrial DNA. And this is called a heteroplasm. That's a very extreme heteroplasm. And you can sort of see that the melanogaster does a lot better with probably the melanogaster nuclear genome than the Yakuba having to deal with the melanogaster nuclear genome and just think about 1500 proteins having to interact with the um, 13 proteins which are produced from now Yakuba-like. So that was the first. The second was the Yakuba allowed us to make specific probes. So when we look at the um, we look at the DNA, so there are the, um, these, the, the protein coding sequences and the tRNAs, oh, sorry. Um, and then there's this region called the D-loop and the D-loop is very variable and doesn't have any genes because if we wanted to make a probe which distinguishes between these two genotypes, we really need it. Um, some area of the mitochondrial DNA that we could distinguish. And so we made a Yakuba and a um, we made a Yakuba and a melanogaster specific probe. And here we can show um, that this is very specific. So here's the probe against Yakuba, and we're looking at a, 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 an egg chamber. Um, you can see Yakuba probe detecting in, in, in the Yakuba egg chamber, the um, mitochondria, but um, the melanogaster probe does not, and vice versa, the melanogaster probe very nicely detects um, the uh, melanogaster mitochondria, but not the Yakuba mitochondria. So that was um, really an excellent um, a tool. Uh, and so the next um, uh, third tool we had was selection. And I already told you that um, the melanogaster mitochondria all carry um, this mutation, this temperature sensitive mutation. And so at 29 degrees, um, through the generations, the mitochondria carrying that mutation will be lost while there's no effect at the permissive temperature 18 degrees. So now we can look by color, basically, if we raise the temperature, is there a selection where we are actually getting now more of the wild type um, uh, 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 Yakuba DNA. And so can we actually image the selection? We knew selection was occurring from previous experiments uh, in the, in the Ofera lab, but we didn't know when it was occurring. And having now visual, being able to visualize the mitochondrial DNA allowed us to do that kind of experiment. And so here's the experiment. So this is, um, this, um, uh, we, we, we focused on the egg chamber because we realized that the selection was occurring during, um, during oogenesis. And um, let me just give you a little introduction to how oocytes are made in the fly. At the very tip here, it's an area which we call the germarium. There are stem cells which keep on, um, uh, by asymmetric divisions, produce um, a, a new stem cell, and then a cell which is destined to develop into an egg. It will first make a cyst of 16 cells. 15 of these cells will be the nurse cells, which produce all the RNAs and proteins and dump these then into the oocyte and then the oocyte can grow. And so what you can see here, and this is not surprising from what I was telling you before, we see mostly pink when we look in the, um, uh, in the ovary when we're not selecting. And I should also um, point out, point out another, um, another tissue. And this is the somatic tissue. These are somatic cells which are surrounding the um, egg chamber. And you can see this here very nicely, um, these somatic cells. So this is germline tissue. So this, come, this is what makes the eggs and this is the somatic tissue. And um, when we now increase the temperature and use the probe, you can see selection happening. So the selection is happening because all of a sudden under this temperature, we see mostly Yakuba mitochondrial DNA. You will also notice something else, and I will get back to this later. You also see that um, the somatic regions did not undergo selection. Selection was ger is germline specific. We're only seeing the selection for the um, wild type genome in the germline. We do not see the selection in the males, and that's what we would have expected because the mitochondria are not passed on. 
And so let's look a little bit closer. What is actually happening? How is the selection occurring? Can we actually figure out the mechanism by looking more closely? And so um, we went further and further back. We basically were looking for when do we see this clear change from mostly pink to mostly green, to green, which is the wild type uh, under selective conditions. And so here again, we have this germline stem cells at the very tip, and then we have the differentiating uh, cysts, and then, then it develops to an egg chamber. And so when we went in more closely, what we noticed was that the selection was not occurring in the stem cells, but it was occurring in these cysts, and it increased as we were going to these early egg chambers. And so we thought, what's happening at these stages? So why, why do we have this transition in the germline? Why is selection specifically occurring at these stages? And for example, not earlier, is there anything happening with the mitochondria? And what we noticed when we looked at the mitochondria at that stage, whoops, is that um, in the stem cells, the mitochondria are fused and are long, connect, long and connected, while you can see in these cysts, there are more dots, they undergo fission, there are smaller units. And so um, mitochondria actually undergo fusion and fission constantly, um, and when they are um, fused, as I told you, then mitochondrial DNA, the multiple mitochondrial DNA molecules in uh, one mitochondrium. But when they, uh, when they undergo fission, there can be many fewer. And we calculated that in the, in, 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 at these stages, there may be only about on average one mitochondrial DNA molecule per mitochondrium. So you can think about this in terms of selection, of course, when we have multiple mitochondrial DNA molecules in one mitochondrium, and one of them cannot produce the products which are used needed for mitochondrial function, but others can, complementation can occur. However, if we only have one mitochondrial DNA molecule, no such complementation can occur. So the model then was that maybe this transition is really important, but we first had to prove that that was actually really occurring. And so here is a big mitochondrial network just to show you when um, you photoactivate a particular part of the mitochondrium, you can see when there is um, a fused network that the color that of the photoactivated fluorescent protein quickly dissipates throughout the uh, mitochondrial network. And so we did the same experiment um, in, uh, in, the, in, 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 uh, in, in Drosophila, in, uh, in this germarium. And so when we photoactivated in the stem cells, we saw rapid diffusion of the fluorescent uh, uh, protein, um, the, the, the activated fluorescent protein throughout the network. However, when we photoactivated in the cyst, it stayed very local, suggesting that indeed a fusion to fission uh, uh, transition had occurred. And so with that, the model then was that initially in the stem cells, we have these fused mitochondria. And so it doesn't really matter when there's some mutant DNA there because the wild type can complement for function. But then there's fragmentation in the cyst and perhaps that fragmentation allows selection to occur. So that was our model. And so we wanted to test that model. And so initially, um, uh, so this is again the model, we have this uh, and then selection occurs. And so we wanted to know if fragmentation is necessary for selection. So we know uh, what kind of proteins are actually necessary for fragmentation and what proteins are required for um, uh, fission. And so one protein which is very important for the fission is the protein called mitofusin. And so if we have too much mitofusin, then um, the, there will be no fission of the mitochondria. And indeed, what we found when we overexpress mitofusin, so now we don't get this fragmentation, we do not see any selection, suggesting now we have these fused mitochondria which can complement. The opposite, if really all that's necessary for the process to occur, if we actually um, now, um, 
induced fission in cells which normally don't undergo it, maybe we can actually see selection. And indeed that's the case. So if we are um, have too little mitofusin or we overexpress the DRP1 fission protein, we see um, uh, that now we can get um, we can get selection at these very early stages. So interestingly, um, this is really developmentally regulated. So this is not something which occurs by accident. This is highly orchestrated. And we can see that the mitofusin protein is specifically downregulated at the stage when we're seeing the fragmentation and when selection is occurring. So the next question was, is the process really germline specific or is it really the induced fragmentation at a particular developmental stage, which then got, gets the machinery for selection going? And so with, for that, um, we moved to the somatic cells. You will remember when we did the selection experiments before, the soma didn't seem to undergo selection. But the mitochondria in the soma are really long mitochondria with multiple DNA molecules. So now we said, so what happens if we are actually inducing fragmentation in the soma? And this is sort of, you know, <laughs> I always tell everybody science is sort of hard. There are so many experiments which don't work. And sometimes there are these moments where you just say, this is just so wonderful. And I still remember where I was when, when uh, uh, Thomas and, and, and Toby were showing me these results, because this is really cool. First of all, we do the fragmentation in the soma and we do get selection. So what that tells us is that the process of selection, that the machinery for selection is actually not specific to the germline as was actually previously thought, but it is really dependent just on the fragmentation process. And so we could then imagine if you would fragment uh, mitochondria in other tissues that you could actually select for working mitochondria and help with mitochondrial diseases. The problem with this is fragmented mitochondria are actually not very good. They are not um, as good in, for example, ATP production through the ox oxidative phosphorylation process. So following were many experiments to figure out what is the mechanism of the selection. So we know now the selection is occurring on the level of the individual mitochondria. So we're, what we found was that um, ATP levels were actually measured. And those mitochondria with lower ATP levels, because they have the mutation, were selected. And they were specifically recognized by mitophagy proteins like ATG1. What we also noticed, and this was also found by other groups, is that there is an increase in the replication of the wild type DNA, mitochondrial DNA. So there are two processes. One is getting rid of the mutant mitochondria, but also amplifying the mitochondrial DNA of the functioning mitochondria by making those mitochondria uh, replicatively more active. And so here are the pathways, the various pathways just to um, that we found. So initially, it is a developmentally regulated fragmentation by the downregulation of mitofusin. Then the mutant mitochondria are actually recognized by ATG1 and the protein BNP3. And that leads to, again, a developmentally regulated um, mitophagy of just those mitochondria, which have lower ATP levels. And then um, uh, at, this, at the same time, um, the, also the mitochondria, which are functional, um, amplify their DNA and uh, that mechanism then um, leads to a selection process. And I showed you that the mechanism of selection is not germline specific and can act in the soma when we inducing fragmentation at that stage. <laughs> 
And so just to summarize what I was telling you, um, I was telling you first about the bottleneck effect, which is kind of the lottery of how the germ, each germ cell gets a different endowment of mitochondrial molecules. And that in flies, um, it seems like when the germ cells form, actually, um, there's care taken that the germ cells get a big endowment of mitochondrial DNA. There's some evidence in other species that um, there may actually be a process where mitochondrial are depleted at the time of germ cell formation. So for example, Jeremy Nance's lab in C. elegans showed that um, the early germ cells, uh, there is a, a cannibalism where part of the germ cells are actually um, eaten by other cells and mitochondria are actually taken out of the germ cells. So it can go both ways broadening the bottleneck or, 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 or diminishing the bottleneck. And then in the second part of my presentation, I told you about a mechanism of how mitochondrial, uh, how mitochondrial fragmentation leads to the selection. And um, these processes, obviously we study them in flies because we can develop these kinds of methods that I was describing to you and we can use uh, genetics very easily. And uh, you know we have lots of uh, uh, material available and there are many advantages to using the fly system, but this is a very, um, a very conserved um, uh, process, obviously mitochondria in all organisms. And um, so these two models that we have here developed um, are obviously now models for um, understanding uh, mitochondrial uh, inheritance uh, in other species. Last not but not least, I want to thank uh, the people in my lab who did this. Much of this work was done uh, while I was still at, at NYU. And in particular, Thomas Hurd was uh, the postdoc who was leading um, this uh, uh, project. And he is now a professor at the University of Toronto. Toronto. And Toby Lieber was a, a senior research scientist, and uh, she has now moved to Memorial Sloan Kettering. And here at uh, Whitehead, um, a postdoc, Melissa Pamela, and a research technician, Susan Savage, are, study, are continuing to study um, how mitochondria are inherited, uh, and especially they're interested in the bottleneck effect. And I thank you all for listening, and I will stop uh, sharing my slides so we can um, actually uh, um, have a discussion about this. And I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much for uh, the great talk. Uh, do we do have a few questions over here. Um, so, okay, uh, the one when this, you know, the mitochondria sequestering to the germ cells are happening during ogenesis, is there any sign there's actual selection also going there, in, uh, not only creating the bottleneck? Yeah, so, so at this point, we have no evidence, but mm -hmm. what, it, what um, uh, Melissa is actually trying to figure out what, what's, what's, what's much harder is in the germ cells when they form to really look at the two genomes. And so mm -hmm. she's doing those kinds of experiments now to really look at if we can see more with the two genomes. Um, and so, um, but, but at this point, the genetics sort of suggests that the selection is really occurring during oogenesis. Mm -hmm. But obviously this is setting the system up, right? So, because if you do get this, um, if you do get, you know, too many mutant mitochondria. So we would really like to know because for, perhaps what's happening actually at that stage, if we could see, for example, when mitochondria, when the germ cells form, they have to migrate to the gonad and, um, there's always 30% of the germ cells die on the migration and we don't really know why. And so mm -hmm. one possibility is, would that be the mitochondria who have more mutant mm -hmm. DNA? So that would then actually death at the cellular level um, as a consequence. So we're, we're curious about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next one is at the developmental stage where selection is happening, uh, is there also a transition from uh, the glycolysis to the oxfos? to promote the selection. Yeah, so that's what we were, of course, thinking, right? Oh, this must be, but it's very interesting. So previously, another study that we conducted, we actually found that during this entire time, there's a very low requirement for ATP. Um, what we found was that for differentiation of the, mito for differentiation of the um, egg chambers, uh, you do need to, um, uh, get the cristae formed really well, and that actually the ATP synthase um, uh, 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 folds the cristae. 
and that um, during that stage, you actually do not need much ATP production, but that is not replaced in the fly case by glycolysis. So we also know this because we've looked a lot at stem cell mutants and mutations in stem cells or what is expressed very highly in the stem cells. And we couldn't actually see that there was a lot of use of glycology. So we, we think this is um, because Clearly, also the ATP levels are red, so so there is a need for ATP synthesis. And so, okay. So the next question is: uh, the mitochondria with wild type DNA, or the mutant DNA, or maybe actual the mutant DNA versus wild type DNA? Do they have a different localization? I guess within the mitochondria. <laughs> Oh, we don't know that yet. So that's not the so so that that would be another level of resolution. But we are we are getting uh, so so the the interesting part about the mitochondria, and this is actually an interesting question for the replication. So it is known that the mitochondria, um, the DNA actually um, sits close to the cristae, and um, and and we are looking at the molecules which are important for replication. And we're actually also because we want to know is this differential replication does. That that have maybe something to see, but this is really at the moment pushing our level of resolution, but we're kind of getting there, but we needing, we need now um, the molecules for the you know, replication machinery, um, for the experts, we're also CFAM, and, and so to co-localize that then with the different types of, of, of DNA. And so we're just getting there. Great. Uh, the, uh, the next one is how does aging may impact the system? <laughs> Yeah, so 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 obviously the the, the a major part problem with a, aging for mitochondria is not that the mitochondria themselves age, but they accumulate more mutations, mm -hmm. and that is uh, and so it's almost so so there are some aging models, and they are actually um, models which are using um, uh, sort of um, not. A, 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 polymerase, which is not as good. And so, so that's sort of a model of aging due to mitochondria. And that's what's basic, what it basically is, is increasing the mitochondrial um, uh, mutation load. So in our model, because we're using these, um, these, these heteroplasmic uh, really from different species to, to see it at this point, um, we cannot see this. So for us to, to really get to the mechanism and when things happen, we have to see it. Uh, what you can do, of course, as aging occurs, you can look at the next generation and for example, in older flies and see that there is a larger mutation pool, but you wouldn't really know, has that been there to the entire development when, this has, when did this happen? Um, so this one, I think you actually, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but I think, you know, there's still, you know, there's a question here. So the, if mitochondria fragmentation is so effective in the maintaining this, you know, the mitochondria DNA, etc., why don't you do it all the time? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so first of all, it's not that effective. Actually it takes um, really, it takes a couple of generations. So there's clearly always some so they are escapers. I mean, you could imagine escapers actually being mitochondrial DNA molecules where you don't go down to fragmentation and you really have exactly one mitochondrial DNA molecule. And that's still something we have to absolutely prove, but that's part of our model. So, so that's one. So, so, it's, so, so you could always get this complementation. Um, and the other is um, mitochondria, so, 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 so mitofusin mutants, so because you could say, oh, why don't you just get rid of mitofusin? Then you always have these small mitochondria and they're, they're actually um, very defective because they are not very effective as mitochondria. So the larger mitochondria are actually much, much more effective uh, in many of the functions of mitochondria. So there are diseases uh, it, that, that are caused to, uh, because of, uh, in mutations of mitofusin. Okay, so, so it's, not a, it's not a solution, but you could yeah, think yeah. of doing it temporarily. So, so one could think of a, you know, temporarily, you know, working drug or that would for a short period gets the fragmentation and then you can get the fission again. So one could, could sort of imagine something like that. I think especially for muscle diseases, that's, that's yeah. where this is, plays a very important role. So we might have one, the time for one more question, which is, I think, um, so actually this is kind of interesting. Uh, what's the implication of mitochondrial fragmentation? Uh, 
and the selection in, uh, for example, IPS cell line or those kind of, you know, when you induce the pluripotency, um, what might happen? <laughs> this is a really cool question. I actually took the slide off out because I thought I was already like a little over. And that is, it's actually a really interesting question for, 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 for also in vitro fertilization in particular. Um, because so so first of all we don't know if there is a so so how does selection work when you go through IPS and you make actually oocytes which are not made through the normal oogenesis phenotype we do not know when selection is occurring in 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 in, in humans although it is very clear that it does occur because of this what I was telling you with synonymous and non synonymous mutations but a really interesting aspect is when you when um, in, in with in vitro fertilization um, so you can you are creating now an environment where the mitochondrial DNA is not matched to the nuclear, the nuclear encoded proteins. Mm. And that's a really interesting aspect because that could give a discrepancy where now all of a sudden mitochondrial diseases will actually come out. And there has been some really interesting um, an interesting study recently by Patrick Chinnery, which suggested that um, some of the mitochondrial DNA mutations are actually balanced because they're all forming complexes, right? They're just providing a few components of the uh, Oxfos complex. And so um, they, they, they're cooperating with, the, with proteins which are made in the nucleus. And so they are, they, they have been adjusting themselves. So you can adjust and, and sort of make it better functioning. But now when people then mate, you know, with somebody who is coming from a very different haplotype line, they do not have these mutations. And then all of a sudden a mitochondrial disease mm -hmm. happens, which was actually covered before by this very interesting interactions between the nucleus and, mm -hmm. and nuclear and mitochondria. So, so there's many aspects of this dance with the mitochondrial DNA versus the nuclear DNA and the contributions to, to, to put together the, the functional mitochondria. Okay, so thank you very much. I think this is all the question that we've got. Um, Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Ruth, for a great presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye.